ask me to yield till I'm finished because I, I don't want to. Uh, I want to tell you how unpleasant it is to take the well in militant opposition to something that is so near and dear to the hearts of so many of my colleagues and people whom I revere. Uh, but uh, I just can't be an accessory to the dumbing down of democracy, and I think that's what this is. And I might also say parenthetically that it is a little amusing to see the stickers that have been worn by so many of my colleagues that says term limits, yes. It doesn't say term limits now. It says term limits, yes. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the great famous prayer of St. Augustine who said, Dear God, make me pure, but not now. <laughs> well, if someone told you on election day you had to vote for this person, you'd wonder if you were back in the Soviet Union. What's the essential difference if they tell you you may not vote for this person? You have limited the range of choices. You have narrowed the circle of possibilities. You have denied a fundamental right free people have in a free country. If this were a trial, I'd call as my first witnesses the Founding Fathers who directly rejected term limits. Chief Justice Earl Warren in the famous case of Powell versus McCormick, 1969 said, and I quote, a fundamental principle of our representative democracy is, in Hamilton's words, that the people should choose whom they please to govern them. As Madison pointed out at the convention, still quoting Justice Warren, this principle is undermined as much by limiting whom the people can select as by limiting the franchise itself. Close quote. In 1788 in New York, in debating ratifying the Constitution, Robert Livingston asked a haunting question. Shall we then drive experience into obscurity? He called that an absolute abridgment of the people's rights. George Orwell, in a review of a book by Bertrand Russell, said it has become the task of the intellectual to defend the obvious. I make no pretense at being an intellectual, but defending experience against ignorance is certainly obvious. Have you ever been in a storm at sea? I have, and I knew real terror till I looked up on the bridge and the old Norwegian skipper who'd been to sea for 45 years was up there sucking on his pipe and I can tell you that was reassuring. When that dentist bends over with the drill whirring, don't you hope he's done that work for a few years? And when the neurosurgeon has shaved your head and they've made the pencil mark on your skull where they're going to have the incision and he approaches with the electric saw, ask him one question. Are you a careerist? <laughs> Is running a modern complex society of 250 million people and a six trillion dollar economy all that easy? To do your job to have a smattering of ignorance in Oscar Levant's phrase, you have to know something about the environment, health care, banking and finance and tax policy, farm problems, weapon systems, Bosnia, Herzegovina, North Korea, not to mention Nagorno-Karabakh, foreign policy, the administration of justice, crime and punishment, education and welfare, budgeting in the trillions of dollars and immigration. And I haven't scratched the surface. We need our best people to deal with these issues. We in Congress deal with ultimate issues. Life and death, war and peace, drawing the line between liberty and order. And do you ever really doubt that America will never again have a real crisis? With a revolving door Congress, where will we get our Everett Dirksons, our Scoop Jacksons, our Arthur Vandenbergs, our Hubert Humphreys, our Barry Goldwaters, our Sam Irvins? You don't get them out of the phone book. Where did Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin get the self-confidence to negotiate peace for their people with the PLO? I'll tell you where experience, bloody, bloody experience. To those of you that are overwhelmed by the notion that this is a very popular cause, let me remind you of what Edmund Burke said to the electors at Bristol. November 3rd, 1774, he said a member of parliament owes to his constituency his highest fidelity 
but he also owes them his best judgment and he doesn't owe his conscience to anybody. I once told an incoming class of freshmen back when they let me speak to them at lunch that they have to know the issues that to be prepared to lose their seat over or they would do real damage here. To me this is such an issue. The unstated premise of term limits is that we are progressively corrupted the longer we stay around here. In answer to that I say look around. You'll see some of the finest men and women you'll ever encounter in your life. The twelve apostles had their Judas Iscariot. We have a higher ratio than that. And I'll tell you, I will not surrender. And I won't concede to the angry, pessimistic populism that drives this movement because it's just dead wrong. Our negative campaigning, our mud slinging, slinging our name calling has made anger the national recreation. But that's our fault, not the systems. America needs leaders, it needs state, statesmen, it needs giants. And you don't get them out of the phone book. New is always better. What in the world is conservative about that? Have we nothing to learn from the past? Tradition, history, institutional memory, don't they count? They have a saying in the provinces, ignorance is salvageable but stupid is forever. This isn't conservative, it's radical distrust of democracy. It's cynical, it's pessimistic, devoid of the hope and the optimism that built this country. This corrosive attack on the consent of the governed stems from two sources. One is well-meaning but misguided, and the other are those who really in their heart hate politics and despise politicians. Well, I confess I love politics and I love politicians. They invest the one commodity that can never be replaced, their time, their family life, their privacy and their reputation. And for what? To make this a better country. All incumbents have an advantage. I guess they do, although not necessarily. You have a record to defend, you have voted on hundreds of bills, and you get socked with them by your challenger who has nothing to defend, and you better be ready to explain how you voted back in 1988 on Graham Rudman or something like that. But listen to me, it's 11.30 at night, and it's a January cold night, and the snow is whirling outside the window, and I'm in a banquet hall. I'm at my one millionth banquet. And I'm sitting there as we're honoring the mayor of one of my local towns. And they haven't even introduced the commissioner of streets yet. And I'm exhausted and I look out the window at the snowstorm and I wonder where my opponent is. He doesn't even know he's my opponent. He's home, stroking a collie dog, smoking a macanudo, sipping from a snifter of crevassier and watching an R-rated movie on cable. But I'm at that banquet again and again. I'll tell you why you have a leg up, good constituent service, accessibility, availability, visibility. You ought to have a leg up. You have made an investment challengers never make. And I won't apologize for that. The case for term limits is a rejection of professionalism in politics. Career politician is an epithet. Careerism, they say, places too much focus on getting reelected and not on the public interest. That is a perfect non sequitur. You get reelected by serving the public interest. Professionals, my friends, will run this government. Only they won't be elected. They will be the faceless, nameless, try to get them on the phone, unaccountable, permanent bureaucracy. There are two contradictory arguments which support this term limits issue. One is that we're too focused on re-election, not close enough to the people, and then you have the George Will theory that we're too close to the people, too responsive, and we need a constitutional distance from them. I suggest any theory that is supported by two contradictory elements like this is standing on two stools which as they separate will give you an awful hernia. Term limits limit the field of potential candidates. What successful person in midlife will leave a career at 50 and try and pick up the pieces at 56 or 62? 
This job will become a sabbatical for the well-to-do elite and bored retirees. And if you listen carefully, if this ever becomes law, that shuffling sound you hear is the musical chairs being played in every legislature in the country. And so the question of 1788 recurs. Shall we then drive experience into obscurity? Shall we perpetrate this absolute abridgment of the people's rights? Listen, last June 6th, I had the honor of standing on the beaches at Normandy with Bob Dole, Bob Michaels, Sonny Montgomery, Sam Gibbons, John Dingle. I guess you'd call us old bulls today but we were very young when we fought in battle 50 years ago. I guess we were citizen soldiers and citizen sailors back then. By some perverse logic, you withhold from us the title of citizen legislators today. But I heard the mournful, piercing sound of bagpipes from a British band scattered among the sea of white crosses and the stars of David playing Amazing Grace. And with eyes not quite dry, I read some of the names on the crosses until I came to one that had no name. It just had a cross there. Here lies in honored glory, a comrade in arms, known but to God. And then I saw another and another like that. No name, no family, just heroism buried thousands of miles from home. And it occurred to me what an unpayable debt we owe these people because they died for freedom. And a part of that freedom is to choose who will govern you. And I can't ever vote to disparage that freedom. And I pray you can't either. I presume to speak for Sam Gibbons and Bob Stump, John Dingle, Sonny Montgomery, and yes, Bob Dole. 50 years ago, our country needed us and we came running. I think our country still needs us. Why do you want to stop us from running? Why do you want to drive experience into obscurity? Have you forgotten the report card we got last November? I have one piece of advice. Trust the people. I yield back.